Hi everybody, Ken Spicer here. Thank you for joining me today on Revere Network. We are interviewing Lucas Miles. He's the author of The Christian Left, How Liberal Thought Has Hijacked the Church. He is a Fox News and Newsmax contributor. He's an author and a pastor, and he's got some tremendous insights about what's going on in our world today. So join me as we hear from Lucas Miles. Day, uh, by talking about your first or your most recent book. And you know, I, I had planned that we would maybe go off the book, uh, which I did read yesterday, found it fascinating, but everything, every other thing I wanted to talk about is in the book. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk a lot about the book today. Uh, just first of all, what was your motivation in writing this particular book? And how did you know, uh, you know, how did you know it was time for this kind of a book? I mean, you know, when we first met, I mean, you would have known me as a grace guy. You know, I was the right. guy out there talking about God's goodness. I was the guy talking about, um, you know, just really helping to people to understand kind of this this radical work that Jesus did on the cross that that transforms, you know, our lives through by grace through faith. You know, mm -hmm. and and uh, that that is still very much a passion of mine. But what I saw was as the, for lack of a better term, grace message was. Uh, um, you know, was gaining momentum during our generation. There were a lot of people who were getting off track and they were using grace as an opportunity to, you know, promote um, acceptance of sin. And, sure. and the, you know, so as that was going on, simultaneously, we kind of had this, this rise of the political left. Um, and then here in South Bend, Indiana, where I live, I'm in a suburb of South Bend, close to the University of Notre Dame. You know, we have Notre Dame, which is a major force, you know, in our, or, I mean, it's really the, the, you know, the, the, the main uh, economic center, you know, besides the RV industry in our, in our area and has a lot of political weight as well. And then we had a mayor named Mayor Pete Buttigieg that a lot of people would be familiar with sure. as who ended up running for president, you know, who's openly gay, who, um, you know, uh, is, you know, would be some form of, of democratic socialist, which is really just code for Marxism. And, right. and um, I saw how many churches in this area began really just kind of bowing down to his rhetoric and, and, and really starting to pivot in their message to take on more of a, you know, more of a identity politics or identity, you know, religious uh, uh, philosophy. And I just felt like the Lord just like, I mean, he just like zapped me and said, it's your time. And yeah. uh, I was planning on writing a book on influence, which is now the, the name of our church, the influence uh, church and influence network. And I totally pivoted. And I began working on on this book, The Christian Left. I wrote the first two chapters on a cruise ship, my very first time on a <laughs> on a cruise before COVID. And um, man, it just it just came. And so right. there was so much as I dug into it. And I just think this is a, a message that people have to hear to avoid these errors. Well, I certainly still see the grace guy in the book, but uh, but I, I what I would consider you close the loop on some things and you you uh, codified some things that you know because it's not just everything goes. Uh, yeah. In fact, anytime there's a biblical. Um, imperative that God expects us to do, or Paul gives, uh, you know, sort of a directive, there's always this heavenly indicative that empowers the action. Yeah. And so, but there is an expectation that we would rise to our identity, I think. And and I think you do a good job with that uh, as that. you as you get that going. So um, you mentioned something in the book that we've actually been talking quite a bit about, and I call it, uh, you know, conversion culture, but you call it the celebrity problem. Mm. And, you know, and then you give some great examples of deconversion, as you put it, and that's an interesting term. Um, you know, how big a problem is that? And do you think that it, there's any culpability to, you know, quote unquote, the church for, for, for kind of creating that culture and to bring about kind of what we're facing today? Yeah, you know, um, culpability is an interesting word. I, I think that it's it's you know it's it's important to recognize trends, where these things come from, you know, the origin, but but only for the purpose of recognizing the responsibility. Whether the church is fully culpable for this or not, 
we still have the responsibility to fix it. Sure. And so I think that, you know, we have to really embrace that. Um, and obviously the church is so diverse, you know, across however many thousands of denominations there are now and everything else that, that it is, it, you know, I think that there's groups that are probably more culpable than others, you know, in mm -hmm. the, sure. in the broadcasting of this. I think a lot of what we're seeing in the deconversion movement is a response to, um, it's a response to, uh, uh, fundamentalism, fundamentalism and legalism. And sure. so, you know, if, if there was a balanced message of grace that, that embraced both grace and truth, uh, I don't think that we would, you know, across the church as a whole, I don't think we would be seeing deconversion the way that we are, but I think that people are pushing back against a lot of the rules, a lot of the stand up, sit down sort of religiosity of church. And, and, um, you know, and I think that's one reason why we're seeing this so heavy in the Southern Baptist convention. Yeah. Now, I, I'm friends with a lot of Southern, Southern Baptists. I, I speak at places like Liberty University. There's some mm -hmm. amazing guys who are, are part of that movement. It's the largest denomination in the United States. Yeah. Um, but, but they are being just, uh, just, you know, ransacked right now by wokeism. Right. And, and I think that, um, I, I don't, I, I think that there's multiple reasons for that, but I, I think that some of the more fundamentalist type of, uh, um, beliefs that have found home in the SBC, or at least in corners of the SBC, I think have partially contributed to this strong pushback from within the SBC. We're not seeing deconversion happening within charismatic churches. We're not seeing yeah. deconversion happening, you know, within, uh, you know, certain other denominations. We're seeing it in social churches like the Vineyard. We're seeing it in, um, you know, legalistic churches. We're seeing it in, in you know, some, you know, more, you uh, um, uh, mainline liturgical, you know, groups yeah. uh, that have always been a little bit more tradition based, but um, you know, it's a problem. It's going to continue to be a problem for a bit. Um, but I think that it, it's, there's still, I'm an optimist. There's still a lot of opportunity for the church to shine right. and for light to really expose the darkness here. So the other side of that coin, and you bring up an interesting point uh, about the distinction with charismatic churches. What you do, though, see maybe a bit more so in the charismatic side of things is the is the abs, you know is the bona fide celebrity pastor. Yeah, and so you don't see deconversion, but what you sometimes do get, like we recently have had in the media, a a a great fall, if you yeah. will, this catastrophic you know moral failure, which yep, yep. really takes a life of its own after that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, my guess is that that's happening to some degree in churches across the board. But when you get a, you know, because of the way in which a lot of your bigger charismatic churches are structured, the 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 pastor has a lot more happening around him than say the guy showing up to a church of 200 and walking into his <laughs> office, you know? I of mean, course. I wasn't met by, you know, a, 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 a throng of, you know, 50, you know, assistants when I walked in the yes, door today. Right, you know, right. I, I, I came in and I'm here, you know, with you. And so, um, but but you have, and, and rightfully so, when churches get so big, I mean, look, you have to have security for pastors. You have to have sure. some of these different things because they're, they're real threats that exist. But you have to balance that with making sure that there's going to be people in his corner that can, you know, kind of keep his his feet on the ground here. Yeah, his sure. Out of the clouds too much. Right. You know? And so we, you know, what we've seen with the Hillsongs and some of these other, you know, movements that have happened and some of the falls that are there, I think that those things are somewhat avoidable. But look, it's as, as a friend of mine once said, it's lonely on the top. And yeah. when you reach a certain level of notoriety, notoriety, <laughs> When you reach a certain level of fame, how about I say that? <laughs> Watch my words today. We'll edit and, that. So. And, and <laughs> you, you reach a certain level of exposure. Mm -hmm. What happens is it becomes very difficult to talk to people around you in a real way without threat of losing it all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, churches really, if they get to that point, my advice would be you have to have the pastor pick one or two people that literally are they're not like, I'm going to share 95% of my life with you. I'm going to share a hundred percent of my life with you, you know, right. to the point to where it's going to, it's going to freak you out, you know, but they need that for, for, to, to, for that level of accountability, I think, to, sure. to, to keep them grounded. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, you know, one of the things going through the book that I really liked about your approach is you take politics and culture head on. And I think there's a lot of people out there, especially Christians 
who are reticent to speak up because uh, they've been told that it's not the Christian's place in culture to say anything, and that if you do, you're a Christian nationalist. Mm -hmm. It seems like your book is giving voice to some of those people. Uh, I'm curious, is that the feedback you're getting? And and what do you think about that idea? And and should Christians speak into politics? You know, I was, when I put this book out, I I knew in advance that we had something, you know, if I can say it like that. Mm -hmm. I knew that Mm -hmm. this was, you know, with, with my first book, Good God, I was just like, happy if somebody read it, you know, right, right. <laughs> you know, it was like, if somebody else read this, I was thrilled with this one. My whole team was kind of sitting around and going like, Hey, we need to buckle yeah. up. Like it's, it's coming. And honestly, I was expecting a lot more pushback, especially for the level of exposure this book has gotten. I mean, I've, I've done in the last 18 months, about 250 media interviews. Um, you know, I mean, it's been a, it's been a big yeah. hustle kind of campaign mm-hmm. for this book. I actually just yeah. finished kind of a, that 18 month tour and I'm, I'm home for a while, which is nice. And the, the, um, interesting enough, we've had a little pushback, but it not near as much as we would have thought. Um, you know, we, religion news service, which is sort of a, you know, I mean, they use the word religion as a, as a, you know, cover, but it's really, sure. a, a, you know, a hit newspaper on all things Christianity is right. what they do. They came out early on. One of their writers came out early on on Twitter and, and started attacking it. He attacked my, my promo video and things for it. Of course, called it Christian nationalism, everything else, yeah. which I'd love to talk about in a second. And, and, sure. um, you know, but, but for the most part, I mean, here's the cool thing. I've been in churches of about every denomination you could think of in the last 18 months. I've spoken to Catholics. I've spoken to uh, Protestants. I've spoken to Charismatics. I've spoken to Baptists. I've spoken to Methodist churches. Um, you know, I've had Episcopals, you know, come to my talks. I mean, it's it's been across the board wow. um, that that, you know, I think that the church as a whole is becoming cognizant of this this drift towards the left. And they're recognizing the need to do something about it. And so, um, and asking, what can we do? And so that's been super exciting. I've had way more positive feedback than negative. I mean, by far. Yeah. And it's really kept me going, you know, in kind of this push. Well, that's positive because, you know, you just never, I guess, you, at least you feel like you never know. I mean, it seems like I think, and I think the left projects very well, you know, in culture and in media for sure. And they seem bigger than they are. And they seem, I think, more powerful than they are. So I'm I'm excited that a book like yours is getting traction in various places because it just it's heartening to know that not everybody's in the bag, uh, so to speak, for the left, and that yeah. people are open to hear some different ideas. So let's talk about Christian nationalism for a yeah. minute. I'm a, I'm a veteran. I was in the Marine Corps. Um, my son was a was a Marine as well. I love my country. Um, why is that a bad thing? Yeah, I, I would say it's not. And, and, and in fact, I would argue that it's not Christian nationalism and that this idea of Christian nationalism is, you know, we have to understand what, what the left is doing here. You know, Christians are not the ones using the term Christian nationalist, (laughs) right? You're, you're not, you're not seeing people going, I mean, maybe a few radical ones now the term is being used or starting to, to do that. But for the most part, um, Christians are not walking in the door and saying, hi, I'm Lucas Miles and I'm a Christian nationalist. Right. Why? Because there is, there is sort of the, the left is, has, they're using this term as a dog whistle. Right. And, and the, the goal of using the word nationalist in media in reference to evangelicals um, is to try to make people associate evangelicalism with Nazism. Mm. And because when you think of the word nationalist or even Christian nationalist, what most people go to is they go to the Nazi party in Nazi. And it's important to understand what happened there. So if I can do a quick little history yes. lesson is in Nazi Germany, there was what you had. Uh, they, they called it positivist Christentum. It was positive Christianity. It was a form of Christianity that that sort of advocates of the Third Reich really pioneered. It was based upon uh, the coattails of, of uh, philosophers like Kant and Hegel and the movement of what's known as the historical Jesus, which sought to kind of, 
you know, eradicate all of the miraculous sides of the gospel because of the rise in rationalism that was happening uh, and, and sort of, you know, uh, uh, on, on the tail end of the Enlightenment, and to introduce a Jesus who is more of a social reformer than the savior of the world. Hitler was very excited about this type of Jesus. He he uh, and he he felt that you know um, that that Judaism was really responsible for tainting the true picture of mm-hmm. Jesus, and and uh, you know brought about all this sort of spiritual side of it. That and they missed the strength of the character of Jesus, this this strong man, you know, who was the champion right. of the state. And so you had people in Germany that, you know, this, the, the, the movement was known as the, the Nazified German church mm-hmm. who embraced this sort of social gospel of Christ. And they set aside Christian orthodoxy in favor of the message of the Third Reich. And they began using their pulpits as sort of propaganda centers for the message of the Third Reich. It wasn't because it was the state that it was a problem. It was because it was a a false gospel first and foremost that it was right. a problem. If if uh, if you would have had somebody in power who was you know proclaiming the true Christian gospel, first of all, you wouldn't have had you know the Holocaust, and right. you wouldn't have had you know this distortion within the churches. And so, but these churches, the thing that made them, I believe, quote unquote, what we call Christian nationalists, mm-hmm. is that they bowed down to the agenda of the state. And they, they um, you know, were converted from Orthodox Christian teaching into uh, sort of this, this uh, progressive view of Christ that propped up the, and allowed for the, 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 um, the, the, the onslaught and the, uh, the repercussions of the Third Reich to actually take place. So I ask people, look at the church in America today. Who looks more like the Nazified German church. What church yeah. is willing to bow down to the agenda of the state that's willing to convert Orthodox Christian beliefs such as God as the creator, uh, God as, right. as you know, uh, establishing marriage between a man and a woman, um, uh, you know, God is establishing personal responsibility and, and personal stewardship as opposed to socialism and, mm-hmm. and you know, uh, uh, sort of entitlement, you know, type of, of theories, equity over equality. You know, who looks more like that? And right. every single time in every single area, the only church that is actually willing to bow down to the, to, to the state right now, that, it, that is actually changing the message of the cross in favor of a message of, of statism and socialism, et cetera, is the Christian left. Sure. And so, and this goes in, this is in line with everything that the left does. And I'll, I'll, I'll pause with this is that the, 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 you know, fascism has a history of this. Socialists have a history of this is the thing in which they accuse that they accuse others of being, they usually are. Right. So as their accusations of Christian nationalism come against the church, I would say if the church is continuing to teach Orthodox Christian principles, and that causes them to say, I want to be the best citizen in this country that God has placed me in. And I'm thankful to be in a place like America where there is still religious freedom and still freedom yeah. of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of, you know, uh, press and freedom, you know, of speech and all these different things. And I, I'm going to celebrate the fact that I'm here and thank the Lord for it. That's just called being a good Christian. That's right. not called Christian nationalism. Right. Well, and, and I see it as, you know, it's like, I guess the inference there oftentimes is, well, you're not trusting God, you know, and and aside from Romans 13, you're not trusting God. So now you're sort of lashing out here. Uh, but, but you know, you could say, well, if that's, if that's your analogy, if that's your logic, then why do you go to, to work every day? Can't you just trust God to meet your needs? Why do you, you know, go to the doctor, just believe for your healing and things like that? So we, you know, so it's really a straw man argument. Yes. And, and I agree. And you did a good job with that actually in the book and you tie in some, some modern day characters, much like, uh, your mayor Pete there who, who really, uh, you know, prop themselves up and make, make their version of Christianity about the doing of things and making it about, you know, helping people and all of that. Really, the gospel, as you and I both know, is about Jesus. And that's the one person they never talk about. 
and, and, and include him in that. So Well, and if they do, they talk about him flipping over the temples at the table. They talk yeah. about him, you know, being a quote unquote refugee. You know, yes. it, it's distorted, you know, and so it, you're right. not going to hear the Christian left talk. You'll never hear Mayor Pete on the campaign trail talk about sin, talk about heaven and hell, talk about, you know, being a new creation. You're not going to even eternity. You're never going to hear right. those concepts, even though he's out there sort of preaching this this Christian, you know, what I would call a Christian nationalist message of uh, bowing down to this, the left's agenda. And so, um, but yeah, those things never are part of it. Why? Because they don't believe they believe in what is known as that historical Jesus. It's actually right. a separate Jesus than what the church preaches, who is champion of the state rather than savior of the world. So these other yeah. more spiritual things never even come into play for them. Mm, that's a good That's a good point. So let's talk about something in the book you call a Trojan horse doctrine. It's one of the three that you mentioned. And I want to get to this um, this double standard where you know, we're the, the church isn't supposed to have any influence on culture, but but it's also supposed to bow down to every every whim of the state. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there there's you know, the, we're seeing this right now with all sorts of things from the some of what's happening around the Roe, uh, Roe v. Wade decision. Um we're seeing it with January 6th trials and hearings. We're seeing it with, um, you know, a, a lot of different areas of of our culture and, and sort of hot topic items. And that is that there's two standards of justice. There's a standard of justice by which um, political allies on the left are tried by or or scrutinized by. And there's a system of justice by which opponents are scrutinized by. And so, you know, this is what allows, you know, people on the left to do, you know, some really, I mean, think about all the things that were happening during Trump's presidency. Mm -hmm. You had, you know, uh, um, you know, comedians and Hollywood types that are holding up pictures of Trump's, right. you know, head, you know, sure. or like, you know, like a mock-up of Trump's head, like hanging with blood dripping from it. And that was okay. Right. But if, if a conservative makes a post that I believe in traditional marriage between a man and a woman, you know, or there's only two genders, that was all of a sudden censored. And so sure. we have this double standard that exists. Um, same thing with, you know, January 6th. And I'm not saying that everything that happened on January 6th was okay. I, I don't, I, I think that nobody should have walked into a building, you know, that they weren't, that they weren't allowed to go into or that they weren't invited into. I think that part of the argument is some people are saying we were invited. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Problem, you know, <laughs> and now we're starting to see all this stuff come up about sure. FBI collusion and everything yeah, else. Yeah. And there's evidence that's coming out on that. St Steve but, Colbert's uh, producers and what what's that? Yo, have yeah, you, yeah, you have Steve that, that's a new one. That go yeah. in. Exactly. Yeah. They're kind of just, you know, really no problem giving a slap on the wrist. And you have, you know, I mean, I, I was just on Flashpoint on the Victory Channel here recently. And, you know, we had a um one of the one of the uh prisoners from January 6th uh called in from prison who's been in basically solitary confinement for about 500 plus days wow. and, you know, telling his side of the story about what's happened. And so, you know, these, many of these people are being held, you know, without a trial, you know, and it's a double standard, you know, wow. if, if there's something wrong, let's try them. You know, if there's, yeah. if there's a crime, let's try them. And, and, uh, and although some of those have happened, you know, it's not been fast enough and, and it's not, uh, you know, it's been, they've been treated to a different standard of justice compared to say, you know, during the Antifa and BLM riots, when you had, you know, Marxists going out, burning down cities. I mean, yeah. the amount of damage that was done when you look at the dollars between what happened at the Capitol versus what happened during BNL, BLM riots. If you look at the damage that was done in terms of loss of life during, you know, the Capitol right. event versus BLM riots. I mean, we had police officers being walked with people walking up behind them and shooting them in the back of the head and saying, that's, right. that's you know, right. During, during the BLM riots, and, and, you know, and, and so like this standard is, is skewed. And as much mm -hmm. as the left wants to claim that, you know, everybody on the left is oppressed, depending on if they're LGBT or person of color or whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, what we're seeing is an ideological oppression that does exist, you know, that originates from the left against any conservative voice. And this goes back to, I mean, this was the, this wasn't, this isn't just conspiracy. This is, you know, there was, you know, the leftist thought leaders in the 60s and 70s, like Herbert Marcuse that wrote about this, who taught, he called it, um, uh, he called it repressive tolerance. Right. He said that the, that the goal of the left is to repress or to, is to basically to tolerate any idea that comes from the left and to, to suppress any idea that comes from the right. 
and and they're doing this. That was the start yeah. of cancel culture, and we're seeing that on a whole new level today. Wow. You know, take place, and it's happening within the church now as well. The church is not exempt to it, especially as the church gets more and more, you know, fractured by all these different viewpoints. You know, we are left with, um, or it becomes a lot harder, I think, for people to hear. A, a, a truly biblical, orthodox gospel message, you know, in a church near them than it's ever been before in, in Christian history. Well, I, I couldn't agree with that more. And it just, it seems like, and you hit on it there, that the church is so fractured because of all of our differences and the things that we elevate so highly. And yet the left seems to be in lockstep. And and yeah. and not just that, but also going back to you know, um, Alinsky and all those things way back then, and you, you're mention, mentioning the other guy, it's like this has been sort of a, a plan that they've had for a long time that's now manifested. You know, I, and, and it does feel like, the, I mean, well, let me back up. First of all, 100% yes, there's been a plan that's been in the works. I mean, there was a there was a socialist communist party in the United States before there was ever the formation of the USSR. Uh, there's been attempts to convert the U.S. to, you know, socialist form of government since mm -hmm. the early 1900s. Um, and they are becoming more and more successful at it because socialists are very comfortable playing the long game. Right. And let me just say this, you know, um, to kind of address maybe an earlier point is, you know, uh, hey, isn't this sort of this uh, um, conflation of Christianity and politics? And is it really OK that as Christians we address these things? We still have pastors afraid to talk about social issues from the pulpit. Right. I, I got a call today from, I won't say his name, but a, a well-known TikTok, uh, we'll call him a TikTok star. I mean, he's, okay. he's got, you know, millions of followers on all of his platforms and a uh, friend of mine. And he called me and he said, he said, Hey, Lucas, I wanted to let you know, I'm feeling led a lot more to speak about political issues and strong Christian guy. And he said, he said, you know, I've just been thinking about it. And the Lord really showed me that if I don't start speaking about political issues, that the only reason I'm allowed to freely share the gospel right now is because of the freedom of religion. And if that continues to be threatened the way that it has been from the left, he goes, there's going to come a day where I can't share the gospel legally, publicly, and we're going to start seeing a new level of cancel culture or persecution yeah. that's going to exist. He goes, because I'm not going to stop. He goes, but I know they're going to take away my platform unless mm -hmm. this stuff changes. And so here you have people that are waking up to this, recognizing their need to get into the fight, you know, to jump yeah. in and, and, and really make sure that their voice can be heard, you know, about this and use their, their influence, the best of their ability. Right. Um, you know, I was watching an episode the other day and my, my wife, we're not, I, I'm going to preface this by, we don't regularly watch this show but my wife had watched an episode of the new Kardashian show. And she goes, you have to see this as like a social experiment sort of thing and understand what's happening. Right. And it was an episode where basically, you know, Kim is kind of working on passing this, this bar so that she, even without going to law school can become an attorney and get her license. And that she's doing a lot of work for people that she feels are unjustly held in prison or unjustly facing the death penalty. And I don't know anything background on the case. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, whether this guy did it, didn't do it. I have no yeah. idea. It, you know, the evidence seemed to support that maybe he wasn't the guy, but again, I'm watching this, you know, from the Kardashians. So yeah. I don't know if this <laughs> is the best place for my evidence. Right. But so I'm just going to say, I'm going to claim ignorance on this part. Yeah. Yeah. But the process that she went through, she sat down with a group of, of kind of activists and that were influential people. And they got on a whiteboard and they started writing down names, you know, and, Steve Kerr from the Warriors. Uh, um, you know, we're going to call, you know, we're going to call Diddy. We're going to call, you know, Jay-Z. We're going to call, you know, this person. And so, and then the whole, the, half the episode is them reaching out to these people calling and, and saying, hey, would you make a post about this? Would you make a post about this? Would you make a post about this? And what you saw is one little issue that was, nobody knew behind the scenes was being strategically orchestrated for a mass, you know, sort of thunderbolt, uh, um, you know, symphony of, mm -hmm. of, you know, influencers jumping on board and saying this. And, you know, Steve Kerr didn't look at the case. You know, he made a post because Kardashian asked him to, sure. you know, and, and so you're just seeing these things that are parroted. Now, that is happening on every single issue that's taking place. The left is really good at strategic organization and using celebrity figures and voices to be able to get a message out. Right. I think that the church, to some degree, we have to get better at that. 
Uh, right. But I think even more so, we have to recognize the individual power that every single believer has in this country, yes. and the voice that they have, mm. and that they have influence right where they are. They don't have to be a Hollywood celebrity in order to have that, but they can they can use their message and their voice there for a purpose. And so, you know, we have to anybody who doesn't recognize that there is a this is a new civil war. Yeah. And it's the, the first shot has already been fired. It's not nobody. Nobody's going to line up with muskets today. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. You know, it's going to happen through political suppression. It's going to happen through political takeover. It's yeah. going to happen through, you know, uh, um, just erosion over time of thought and taking over school systems through this. This is the communist way. They would prefer yeah. to never have to fire a shot. But we are in a war and we have to start thinking that way. And it's an ideological war. And so we have to fight it ideologically yeah. and we have to use our voices to really see, you know, I think, I think good triumph over evil in this season. God wins in the end without yeah. a doubt. But sure. It doesn't mean that this battle in America is going to be won. You know, there's been a lot of countries who have fallen as a result. That's right. of We're not exempt from that if we, if we just sit back and do nothing. Well, and it's easy to see when you just see the wokeism and the, the high levels, even in the military, that these things are are happening, and and just to you know, kind of to your point with with uh, Kim Kardashian, it's interesting that when Trump was in office, all she had to do was go down to the White House if she wanted somebody out of prison, yeah, uh, more so than any other president. Yes, um, but I do. It's it's nice to see. I appreciate you putting yourself out there on your platforms and in your your influence. And you know, you talk about this TikTok guy. M you know, one of my thoughts earlier was, have you lost any ministry friends since you've been? Mm -hmm sort of walk in this path? Yeah, you know, um, some, yes, for sure. And and I think that, and I think just some friends in general, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've, I've shared openly on multiple platforms that when we started, I mean, I, I didn't really start talking about cultural issues until uh, probably 2015, 2016. And it was right on the tail end of, of my book, uh, Good God, coming out. And I started recognizing the how fast the grace message was just getting polluted by a bunch of, you know, uh, kind of... Uh, um, uh, extremists and everything else, yeah. and really was starting to think about how to how to course correct that. Uh, I I think probably a little bit more, and I'm going to use this term carefully, but more apostolically minded mm -hmm. in the sense of the the church, what's happening in the church in general, rather than always kind of localized. And so I, yeah. I like the big picture conversation of the church, um, and and that's where a lot of my writing you know goes. And I think it, that's portrayed there. But it's uh, when I started preaching about cultural issues, basically the Bible's perspective on, you know, abortion, marriage, mm -hmm. uh, sexuality, all this stuff. We lost 40% of our church in 2016. I saw you yeah. say that in a recent yeah. interview. And that's yeah, it, uh, interesting. It, it, it wasn't that, I mean, you know, people are like, well, what were you preaching before? We were preaching before. We were doing exegesis of scripture. We were talking about the character yeah. of God. And we were talking occasionally about, you know, these social issues. It wasn't that we were not pro-life before 2016. Of right. course we were, right? But we started going, we're going to do a series on this topic. And so we're going to do a couple of weeks on abortion. We're going to do a couple of weeks on marriage. Mm -hmm. We're going to mm -hmm. do a couple of weeks on this. And that was the first time that I had ever done, done topically that much of a deep dive into those topics. And we started seeing, you know, people walking out the door. I'm in a, wow. a super majority red state, but we're in a blue county that's been blue for 50, 60 years mm. at a mayoral level. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of, of leftist thinking in our area, and that was really exposed. Now, I wouldn't trade where we're at for the world. I would do it all over again. Our right. church is the strongest it's ever been. It's the best we're doing financially. It's the best sure. we've ever done. You know, leaders, people, you know, we had six, you know, people get saved and baptized last week. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, seeing, we're seeing the Lord move and do some really cool stuff here locally. Um, the, you know, with that said, I think that, you know, it's, we, we can't stop. Right. You know, we have to keep addressing these things. We have to be on guard against a push towards legalism because that's the, and that's where I'm trying to help people understand where this goes from here. Right. Right. Is that the next phase in the church is that we're so busy calling out the offensives, offenses to orthodoxy that unqualified people start leading the witch hunts and and that what happens is the church starts moving further and further towards you know uh, legalism because we don't want to be the thing that we're trying to push against. Right. So we have to make sure during the season that we stay really, really firmly rooted in grace and truth. Mm -hmm. And that is always the litmus test. If you have if your truth is going you know higher than your grace, there's a problem. Yeah. You, you know you become a bigot. 
if your grace goes higher than your truth, you know, or a concept of grace goes higher than truth, you become, you become a progressive. So we have to always watch out for that. And in order to avoid error. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, you know, th- this kind of brings me to my next question. What I really loved re- about reading um, through your book is your championing of scripture. And it seems like, I mean, you have a very literal interpretation of things. And I've heard people say that they they suggest or that they personally had a more literal interpretation. I wonder if there's a difference between having a literal interpretation and a more literal because again, uh, I recently read a, a Christian book by a guy who's been around a long time. He pastors a big church and he's well received in a lot of circles. I won't mention his name, but just in the first two chapters of his book, basically he is saying that if you believe in a literal Genesis, which you mentioned in your book, then you're basically some kind of an anti-intellectual. And I, and I find that some of these guys are, you know, elevating man's let's say progress over the the centuries over scripture. Yeah. And I find that yeah, troubling. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, um, you know, a lot of this, and I actually have a friend, uh, Kevin McGarry, who's uh, um, has an organization called every black life matters, really incredible individual out mm. in California. And, and he's, he's been talking about this quite a bit, you know, Darwin ruined a lot of things, you know, for, for this nation and for the world, really. Uh, he was a believer in critical theory. He was actually a believer in, um, I mean, he was essentially a racist and, mm-hmm. you know, you look at his book, it's of favored races is this origin of species, you know, in the full title. And so that, that sort of evolutionary philosophy has been, has been really pushed down. It's what, it's what fueled Hitler. It's what fueled, you know, uh, somebody like Mar- Margaret, uh, uh, Sanger with right. pro, uh, Planned Parenthood. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it, it continues to fuel how the church operates today. Even critical race theory, is fueled by racism and not just racism right. of like against whites. It's actually racism. When you really read critical theorists, what they're waiting on is it's a Hegelian approach that they are waiting on white people to recognize basically their, you know, one of them even writes and says their perfection as people in order to help bring about sort of this, this utopian society. And, and that is, wow. Again, it's it's a colonialist mindset. It's that the white man has to come in and we have to save it, you know. And and, and like that. That's and the irony is this is being shared by critical race theorists, a lot of whom are white themselves. Right. So it's one more form of ideological, you know, oppression against right. blacks. And so, critical race theory is part of the oppressive, you know, uh, um, uh, system that that exists in pockets. It's not systemic, but it is. It, exists in pockets against the African-American community. Uh, that, that hasn't been talked about enough. Uh, and so, you know, what you're seeing from some of these pastors on this issue of, of you know, inerrancy or, or kind of do we read scripture literally? Uh, scripture, first of all, is very clear. It says that every scripture is God breathed, you know, useful for correcting, teaching, right. you know, re- rebuking, perfecting and righteousness. And so the, um, you know, uh, there's no scripture. And I, I don't believe that we should give higher value to one scripture over another right. in the sense that if it, all of it is God breathed, then it's all, I mean, how many of God's words are important? I would say any <laughs> word that God says right. is important because it's God who's saying it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so when we look at this, there's actually, you know, there was, uh, I, I, I'm, without giving too much on my new book, I'm kind of doubling down on this topic. You'll, I think you'll enjoy the direction that we go with this one. I can tell you offline a little bit more about it, but um, you know, the, you know, we're seeing uh, there was um, there's a famous um, apologist, William Lane Craig, that recently came out stating that he didn't believe in a literal atom um, and, and this is, this guy is a well-known, like he's been in the corner defending Christianity. And, and I don't want to discount the rest of his work over this one issue, right? but here would be an example where there's a, there's an erosion that happens and he has shifted and he now is proclaiming a his, basically what is known as a historical Adam. We talked already about the historical Jesus philosophy, yeah. which is yeah. seeing Jesus as sort of like that. We have to find the real Jesus through all this, you know, uh, mm-hmm. supernatural, you know, nonsense that scripture states. The same thing is happening with Adam. It's a search for the real Adam because we can't trust the, we can't trust the Adam presented to us by scripture. Wow. So we have to dig a little deeper with our great intellectual, you know, minds and sure. we have to find the real Adam that God wasn't smart enough to tell us about. I mean, that's, that's sort of the, the subtext that's there. 
And I would say if you're approaching the Bible and you're already stating, you're already questioning its inerrancy after the first chapter, right? we have a problem. Right. Where are you going to go when you're 30 chapters in, <laughs> yeah. when you're 80 chapters in, where you're 300 chapters in? Right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's a major issue. And so, you know, um, that is, it really sets the stage. This issue of was there a, where, was there a real worldwide flood? Was there a real Adam? Uh, was there a real, you know, uh, you know, seven day creation period? These matter because it's really asking, is God honest or is God a liar? Right. Now, I know that there's all sorts of responses that somebody would have, you know, like the pastor you mentioned, I could probably guess out of three people who I think it is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who's saying it. It's it's a it is an emphasis of human thought over you know, scriptural truth. I am not a literalist in the sense that, you know, um, let me say it this way. I'm a, I believe in that we read the Bible literally in context. Yes, exactly. When the Bible tells us it's a parable. Sure. I don't really believe that there was a guy walking around (laughs) doing this in his garden, the way that Jesus, I just think he's saying there was a guy, you know, it's a parable. It's it's Mm -hmm. a story. It's a, it's a, this is, you know, think of it this way sort of moment. Yeah. So we, we receive it as a parable. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when we read something like, uh, um, you know, uh, like, like for instance, if King Saul, you know, who was the Bible told us was tormented by evil spirits. When Saul says something that does not become a guide for my life. Right. It, It becomes, I'm reading the Bible in context. I believe that Saul literally said that. Um, but but I am reading that as a guy who's tormented, and I'm yes. not taking that as advice I should follow for my life. Right. The same way with, uh, say, the book of Job, which I talk about in Good God. Job's friends were all rebuked for what they said. So when they said, you know, ridiculous things about God, I don't take that as this is a biblical, that that's a, that's a theological truth. I take it as scripture showing me this for a reason. So right. I can understand the process that people go through and everything else. But the Bible never alludes to there ever being a allegorical approach to Genesis chapter one. Exactly. Jesus actually references creation. We see Paul reference creation the same way as a literal Adam. Mm-hmm. And I think anything less than that does, uh, it, it, it's, it does, it, at the end of the day, does if it were just that issue, if it were just Adam and Eve or just the yeah. Noah's Ark, who cares? But it's not. It's right. it's questioning the for the the our, our embrace of scripture as a whole. And the moment you topple over a portion, you're topple, toppling over all of it. I agree. I agree. And that's um, uh, it's uh, it's something that we're hearing more of these days. Like you say, even from people who you know have been esteemed as someone that's trustworthy in these areas. Yes. Um, so now. Uh, Kind of hitting on something that maybe we talked a little bit about before. You had talked about something in the book, and I don't think you use the term seeker sensitive movement, but you you referred to this idea of being more more aware of seekers and and things like that that created an ideological collision and and the result of that collision, uh, you know, being um, you know, essentially, Lots of salvations and not many disciples. Now, that's yeah. uh, to a point I made earlier. That's kind of something that we've been calling conversion culture. It seemed like there was a time in the American church where it became really exciting to fill altars with people who, you know, in all likelihood had been saved before, but they've, you know, right. been sort of scared to, you know, to to not come to the to the altar. And then when you did that, you sort of had this shift where there weren't many. You know, a lot of people talk about discipleship, for instance, but it's kind of like a unicorn in the American church these days. Nobody ever sees it, you know. Uh, You go to a class, you get a certificate, and, you know, arguably now you're a disciple. So, you know, what was your, you know, what was, give me a little background on that idea as you talked about it. So, um, the, my sort of uh, uh, more casual term for this is what I call the genetically engineered church. Mm. And... The, you know, I always ask people, would you rather eat an orange that's seedless or an orange with seeds in it? And with with the exception of like the person in the back that does yoga every day and only <laughs> shops at the organic, you know, uh, uh, grass-fed, you know, cat right. grocery store type of thing. 
most people go, man, give me the seedless all. I mean, my, my wife went and bought watermelon. I love watermelon with sun butter. That's like my thing. And I know it's weird, but like I eat those two together all the time. She, she grabbed some watermelon for me the other day and she actually didn't accidentally got, I think the only kind they had were, was with seeds in it. And yeah. I was like, so put off. I was like, <laughs> how am I supposed to eat this? You got to work at this now. It. You know, this is terrible. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. You have to work for it. Right. Yeah. And so this is what happened in the church. The church was looking for a way to be able to grow um, converts, grow disciples as fast as possible and as effectively as possible. They were looking for a way to make a bigger difference. And they saw, I think that some of these early thinkers in the seeker sensitive movement, we'll use that term. I think they saw the, the, maybe the, um, the bulkiness of the word of God as a, as an obstacle to the, their desire to kind of work through these things faster. Right. So they thought, yeah. and you heard a lot of this back in the Rob Bell kind of error of the church, right. error of the yeah. church, maybe error and error yeah, of right. the church and, and uh, Freudian slip there. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, about the story of God. Yeah. And this is where a lot of the down, you know, where that we started downgrading scripture from just being a, uh, you know, from, from being the word of God to being some sort of, you know, maybe inspirational book or maybe mm -hmm. story of God, these sorts of things, but we're not going to take it verbatim. And so they began extracting the word out. So services went from, you know, four or five songs and 45 minutes to an hour plus of teaching to, you know, three songs and a 20 minute talk and, yeah. you know, maybe some sort of response at the end or offering or whatever. And, and so, and we saw that shift happen. And as people were trying to get more and more people through the door in these larger churches, we got to shorten services, we got to do everything else. And look, there's a place for, you know, evaluating sure. what's the mm -hmm. best, you know, service time or whatever. I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, I, I teach for 45 minutes every Sunday, you know, and it's, and it still doesn't feel long enough most yeah, of the time. Right. You know? <laughs> and we've talked about shortening that, but you know, I'm, I like it, you know, and I, yeah. I think that our people come because they want to hear the word and everything sure. else. And so, um, so it, it, they produced this genetically engineered church that was, it was just as sweet as before. It was just as bright colored, but now it had the seed removed. And so people didn't choke on it and right. it was easier to consume. Now, the problem with a genetically engineered piece of fruit is that it only lasts for one generation Yeah, because it doesn't have a seed to reproduce a good itself. point. Yeah. So what happened in the seeker sensitive movement, I'm not questioning whether or not these people got saved, whether or not they were converts or anything like that, but because they didn't become, you know, really the, the word never became saturated in their life and never right. got planted. Um, they, they weren't able to effectively reproduce themselves in their next generation. And so the next generation got a super watered down version of the gospel because, you know, people would say, oh yeah, Jesus, God, you know, you get saved. It's all good. You know, and like right. they had no place to actually point them to teach them the word. And so the next generation, I think was, you know, kind of this younger millennial into kind of now Gen Z, they were just perfect prey for leftism to grab a hold of. Sure. And we had kind of the birth of the Christian left through that of people that never, you know, really got fully, you know, um, uh, disciple, you know, in the yes. sense, or yeah. they got discipled by the academy and mm -hmm. they went to, you know, I mean, I got friends that went to, you know, University of Notre Dame theological school and, right. you know, you, I mean, they're, they basically lost their salvation, you know, when they walked sure. through the doors and, and that's not everybody. And that, I'm not saying that's just no. Notre Dame's fault, but like, there's something about that critical theorist sort of approach that, that whittles down your faith and breaks you down before it builds you back up. And that's the nature of critical theory. It's its goal. And it really wrecked havoc, you know, on the church. Yeah, I agree. Now, uh, you bring up critical theory. I, we watched um, a clip of yours where you were at a local high school talking mm -hmm. about critical theory and critical race theory. And you mentioned that you're, a, you're you know, a national authority on this. Is that something that you just sort of happened into? You just did the research, you did the reading, you put it all together. How'd you get to that place? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's always tough. I had somebody criticize me here recently on social media because I, I, you know, opened up on a TikTok video by saying, hi, my name's Lucas Miles. I'm a pastor, best-selling author. And, and they felt like as a Christian for me to, you know, for me to boast about the fact that I was a best-selling author was like <laughs> the worst thing in the world. And, yeah. you know, I, I said, look, I have 30 seconds with somebody. Yeah, know? it's and, social media. I mean, and I have to get them to, you know, decide whether or not they want to listen to me. And 
I am a best-selling author with my last book. And so, you know, if that helps keep somebody 10 seconds longer, sure. you know, for them to hear what I'm saying, I'm going to use every tool that I have. Of course. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not gone to my head. It's just, it's a tool. It's a resource to reach people. And mm -hmm. so, you know, um, in that particular video you're talking about, it wasn't my local high school. It's where I graduated from. And I was invited back by a school board member. I was invited back by multiple parents. I was invited back by multiple students who, and it's down, it's in the community that I still pastor in. And they said, Hey, you know what? We've been watching what you're sharing, what you're doing. You know, uh, again, I've done, you know, 250 plus media interviews. Um, most of which have been talking about critical theory and wokeism. Um, and, and there's, there's probably not a whole lot of people that could claim that they've done that many media interviews right. about wokeism in the last, you know, 18 yeah. months. And so, you know, I, 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 I know, you know, I, I'm recognizing that I am sought after on this topic. Mm -hmm. There are people that are way more brilliant than I am who, you know, I, I mean, I've read a lot and I do a lot of study in this space. I read a lot of, you know, contrary works, you know, starting with Hegel and Marcuse and these other guys, Marx, et cetera, but um, as well as modern voices. But, you know, I, I know that uh, there's people that, you know, this is this is their next level than me. So I don't want to claim, yeah. you know, something, yeah, sure. a, a title that I'm not given. Right? <laughs> that, that's my caveat. Yeah, yeah. With that said, in this clip, um, I was um, I was given the SEL curriculum, social emotional learning curriculum <clears throat> from the high school that I graduated from of what they have now in place. And the school is claiming that it is not critical race theory or does not possess critical theory. And the um, the parent groups that are up in arms about this are going, yeah, it does. Yeah. And, you know, all over the place. So they brought me in and they said, hey, as somebody who, and I don't, I don't have any, my wife and I don't have any children, so we don't have any kids in the system. Now I care about what the school's teaching, but sure. I, I'm not as emotional about it here locally as <laughs> the, the parents that have a kid that's in there yeah, for good reason, you know? And I mean, I'm, I'm emotional for them, but it's still different. And so uh, they gave me the curriculum and they said, hey, would you review this? And so I tried to do a very honest review and say, look, this is, this is CRT, this isn't, this is CRT, this isn't, this comes straight from Marx, this comes straight from Marcuse, this is Hegel, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Ibram Kendi, Robin D'Angelo, you know, more uh, Derek Bell, these other more modern voices. And it was all over the place. I mean, mm -hmm. it was it was absolutely without it. And again, this is a this is Indiana, right? If this yeah. is happening, and this is like the farm school in Indiana, like this is the <laughs> suburb school. This isn't the yes. inner city school, right? Like this is the suburb school that always has the good football team of farm kids, you know, and everything yeah. else. Yeah. So if this is te if they are teaching CRT in their curriculum, and that and so I, I presented the school board, you know, basically a choice. You can either claim that you just didn't know what CRT was and you didn't understand critical theory as an educator, and so you weren't able to recognize it, or you know exactly what it is and you're intentionally covering it up and hiding right. it. And I said, I'm going to assume in this video, I said, I'm going to assume it's the first one and that you're just ignorant of this and that you didn't know. But now that I've showed you, you know, as an expert on this topic, as somebody who's gone through and done the review on this for you, I've done a, a you know, a, I've done a, a free audit for you of your curriculum. Yeah, yeah. And now that you know, what are you going to do about it? Well, I don't think the school's done a whole lot about it. Uh, ironically, the 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 um, the superintendent it shows up at every conservative Republican event that there is, you know. Oh, yeah. And and we have you know we have a, at least a hey how's it going relationship. Yeah. But he knows where I stand, and I've been very vocal <laughs> about it. And um and and it it blows my mind that you have somebody who's conservative politically who is not recognizing this and not doing enough about it. He could right. take a strong stance and say, not in my school. Sure. I just, I'm, I'm requesting the board to address this. Yeah. And at least from what it is on the surface, he does not seem to be doing that. And I think that this is happening at, at schools all around uh, the country. And I think that, you know, our, our public education system is, is bankrupt on many levels. It doesn't mean every school doesn't mean every district, but uh, man, what a tough time for parents to make these decisions. And uh, and I think that if your kid's strong enough, they can make it through. But if you have a kid that's easily swayed by this and you're not talking about this stuff at home, you know, don't be surprised when they wake up, when you wake up one day and they're a leftist yeah. you know, in the process because they are being groomed for, even if, even if schools are not grooming our kids sexually, which is also a concern, I do think that is happening yeah. at some districts and with some teachers, um, they without a doubt are being groomed to be critical theorists. And, and that is, that is, uh, that's a, a, almost for me, a bigger concern in the sense that if you can get somebody to become 
a true critical theorist, all these other issues are going to follow. And, right. and, and, and it's, uh, um, you know, it, it's really, and this is the goal of socialism and communism, which I would use almost in, in, uh, uh, you know, unison with this idea of critical theory. It's where they, it's where socialism and communism came from yeah. is that the goal of that is to start as young as possible and to affect the kids and to reach yeah. the kids in that way. And so, you know, um, parents have to be vigilant. Sure. They have to be awake. Yeah. And, good on the parents too. I mean, they're yeah. seeing that cause, cause I mean, I think I would imagine a lot of communities like that, that probably tend to be more conservative. Um, maybe they're not paying attention cause they wouldn't yeah. assume that those things would be taught there. Yeah, but um, it's not always those local here's, people here's the irony. making the call. The, the the woman who brought in this curriculum and who has been championing it is the wife of a pastor in our region, wow. and so she, and she has, I mean, she has been all over this, you know, laying down on the road to protect the CRT SEL curriculum, and uh, and so you know, I mean, you asked this question initially wow. of. Uh, you know, prior to that of have I lost ministry friends? And yes, I've lost some ministry friends because this family was a friend. Um, and I watched them go woke. Yeah. You know, I, I reached out. There was another major church in our area where the pastor taught a whole message about uh, uh, white fragility and microaggressions and all this stuff on Sunday morning. And I, I wrote him I wrote him privately and I said, hey, you know what? I, I get that you have a giant church and you have to address some of these topics. But man, I'm telling you, you know, I have a lot of concern about what you present. And this is a yeah. friend, you know, wow. um, that, that I knew wouldn't even, wouldn't even write me back on it, you know, just wow. wouldn't even address. And I, I offered, I said, love to sit down and just unpack this with you personally. Don't have to bring anybody else into it. Like, can we just sit down and talk about it? No response back. And so, mm. um, you know, it, these big churches, they're following the other big churches from guys like the guy that you mentioned who are writing these books, right? And, right. you know, and they're just doing, they're parroting what they see, and unfortunately, it's it's leading the church in the wrong direction. But again, I'm an optimist. There's yeah. a, there's a big movement back towards orthodoxy, uh, and I think a lot of people waking up to uh, um, just the uh, the deception that this is. I, I think the enemy always overplays in areas yeah. like this, and and I think you're right. Um, you know, just uh, I don't know if you know who um, Larry Alex Taunton is, um, I don't. but he's a bit of a historian. I think maybe by vocation at some point now he, he, you know, writes and he's written books and things. And, and he shared back when all of this was sort of kicking off uh, with, you know, let's just say BLM and all of that, that in the mid 1800s, um, Marx was in London and there were a lot of future famous people there. At that same time, people that we would come to know, Charles Dickens, Charles Darwin, people of every sort of uh, of interest. Uh, but there was another famous guy already there as well, and that was Spurgeon. And he says that that essentially Marxism couldn't take root in Western Europe because Spurgeon was preaching against it from the pulpit. And um, so I don't know if that's that's your familiarity with that, but I think that it just, these are the days when when I think we do need to sort of speak yeah. up and, and stand our ground and encourage those around us. Cause I think people get swept up mm -hmm. in the, um, you know, you talk about losing people in your church and I was trying to, there was a lot of social pressure to sort of be sensitive around certain events in our yeah. society at the beginning of BLM. And I was, you know, I felt that pressure cause I had a, a very um, multi ethnic church. So I brought in a guy a friend of mine who I'd known 20 years who, you know, was African-American. And so we had this conversation and it, and it sort of ended with him lecturing police officers and, you know, people like that, which we had a lot of, you know, <laughs> in our church. And it just, the tone of it sort of irritated me. And then I felt this, I felt this push toward, you know, uh, you know, people apologizing for being white and this and that. So the ne very next week, I just announced to our church that, you know, don't hold your breath because I won't be apologizing for the way God made me. Yeah. And and that began probably over the next month. Uh, and of course, that just led to other comments that I was, <laughs> that I would spend 15 sure. minutes before every sermon sort of giving a little recap. Uh, and so we lost probably that amount of people as well, maybe 30% of our church. Um, and we always championed, you know, this, this, uh, 
you know, tolerance of ideas. Like, you know, you should be around people that think different than you. You know, yeah, you said you yeah, read yeah. a lot of, of counter uh, information. I don't think you could have a real solid position if you don't. But as soon as I started giving my opinion, there was no acceptance of that, you know, and right. I found that to be quite interesting. But at any rate, you know, I don't want to keep you all day. Uh, I want to bring up a couple of other things and then we'll let you go today. I appreciate your time. Yeah, but sure. um, I sent your TikTok video to my team, which we spend a lot of time talking about these things because we're on TikTok as well. And the, when you were answering a question and you talked about being a theological mutt, and that kind of encouraged all of us because we all kind of feel like we don't really belong in yeah. any particular camp. Uh, how do you feel like that background may have, you know, uh, uh, strengthened you for a time like now? And and are you accepted across, you know, various theological, um, you know, groups? You know, it's interesting. I mean, right now during this season, as I as I said towards the beginning, I've been able to kind of preach in churches, you know, of every denomination across the board. Um, and, and, uh, and been, re you know, received very well. Um, the, when you, and I talk about this a little bit in the book, it, it's important to understand what is this term orthodoxy and what is, you know, what is doctrine, you know, mm -hmm. and I give the example in the Christian left of this, you know, I like growing up near Lake Michigan, you have these big swim buoys that are out on the water and, you know, they're usually kind of white or orange or red or whatever. And, and they float on the surface and they have, you know, this big, this big, you know, uh, float on the top with a cable that comes down and some sort of, you know, stone in the bedrock that it's, that is bolted to. And so it's able to sort of go in a circle and sort of spin around and, and it makes this circle around that, the, the spot where it's fixed at the base and depending upon how long the chain is and how big the waves are that day and everything else. So, you know, doctrine is a lot like that. There is without a doubt, there is an absolute true doctrine. Mm -hmm. Now, as the pastor joke goes, 15% of what I teach is wrong. I just don't know what 15% it is. <laughs> and so, you know, something I'm saying I'm sure is not correct fully, even though I think it all is, just because of the odds of that seem very unlikely. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that, you know, when we all go before the Lord, there's going to be our eyes open to certain aspects. Now, there are certain things that we know definitively and that is what we call Christian orthodoxy. Right. And so although the Bible does not talk about primary doctrines and secondary doctrines, in practicality, there exist primary doctrines and mm -hmm. secondary doctrines, and we could argue, you know, tertiary doctrines that, that sort of make up the Christian life. You know, uh, the belief in the Trinity, uh, heaven and hell, um, you know, some form of depravity of man or original sin, uh, uh, the, you know, God is a creator, um, you know, marriage, all these sorts of things. Th these are primary doctrines. And then we have secondary doctrines like the role of women in the church, uh, speaking in tongues that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. are the gifts active today? Um, these aren't salvation issues, you know, but they are, um, they are major important issues, yeah. but there is more, gr there's more opportunity for, like, I could make a biblical case for, you know, um, uh, uh, free will. And I could turn around, and I can make a biblical case, you know, for um, basically some form of reformed, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, thought or Calvinistic sort of perspective, right? Sure. And so mm -hmm. we could, we could approach that both ways. And I could do it with scripture, and it would be rather convincing. Now, I have embraced one of those. Yeah, but, but, you know, and I'm very strong on it. But it is, it is, I don't, I don't lose fellowship personally. Now they, the other side might lose fellowship with me <laughs> over my perspective, but right. I don't lose fellowship personally with somebody because whether or not they believe in free will. Um, I, I, I would though lose Christian fellowship with somebody, not mean I'm going to be mean to them, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to lock step with them in ministry if they don't say believe in the Trinity or if right. they don't say believe in, you know, uh, uh, repentance from sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and so um, I think that that as as a church, we have to be a little bit more comfortable and honest with ourselves and kind of humble about what we believe and recognizing the difference between primary and secondary beliefs. Unfortunately, I think some on the more fundamentalist side are just unable to do that. They yeah. would say there's no such thing as a secondary doctrine. They're all primary mm -hmm. doctrines. You yeah. believe, you know, and I'm not saying we, we're picking and choosing what we're going to take from Scripture. I'm saying that I can argue the passage about Paul's view on women two different ways. And I think right. they both have some biblical backing behind them. I think one is right, 
but but yeah. that that you know um it, it always you know the person who is the more fundamentalist always appears more right because they seem like they're stricter in their viewpoint right 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 so um i i think that that becomes a challenge and and so for me i grew up in the church of christ um sort of fell into you know assembly of god for about a year um mm -hmm. kind of licking my wounds from post-traumatic church disorder a yeah bit. right ended up in a non-denominational um you know charismatic church that um was was probably similar to the early vineyard at that time mm -hmm. but, but never really embraced sort of the social gospel aspect thankfully um I flirted with socialism for a time myself in my early, I mean, when my wife and I first got together, I was basically a Christian socialist or at least on the verge of becoming one. Um, so, you know, this is coming from a guy who's walked down that road. Sure. I was a philosophy major at a secular school. I went through all the classes, you know, I read a lot. So I've read a lot of, uh, um, I actually, I love reading reform theology, even though I'm not reformed myself. I've, I especially re love reading patristic history, which is kind of all the early thinkers, which, yeah. you know, the Catholic church kind of claims and they, they all have a saint in front of their name. Right. And right. So, you know, it's like, I can hang with a conservative Catholic. I can hang with a reformed guy. I can hang in a, in a charismatic, you know, meeting, you know, and I have sort of this little bit of theological side, but it, you're right. I, I don't necessarily yeah. feel like that. I go to any one place and I go, this is my home. Right. You know, I mean, right, it's, right. it's depends on the topic. Uh, yeah. If I'm talking about spiritual gifts, there's pro I feel probably a lot more home at say you know uh, Andrew Womack's Karis Bible College teaching right. yeah. than I would at you know Biola. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but if I'm if I'm you know if we're talking about these issues of the Christian left and Marxism and everything else, people I think for the most part the church has said, look, Lucas, we get that we probably might not lockstep on everything, but on this issue we're on the same page. We're extending you fellowship and come out here and share this. Yeah. That's great. Okay, so lightning round, just yeah, yeah. very quick, couple of thoughts on each of these. There's just three of them. I'll give them to you all at once. Midterms, Roe v. Wade, 2024. Let me start with Roe v. Wade. So I was I was in D.C. when the announcement was made. I was three blocks away from the Supreme Court with some of the Newsmax team. Uh, I, I saw you there that night. I was wondering yeah, if yeah. how you jumped a plane that quick. It, was, it wasn't intentional. <laughs> I just had I had interviews and other meetings that I was going to, and I, we were having dinner down the street. And uh, the one of the a Newsmax anchor was there at dinner, and she like gasps and looks at her phone and and sees the announcement about the leak. And so I said, "How far away is that?" And so three of us drove down there and and uh, ended up kind of being right in the middle of the story, literally. Um, you know that night. I think it's going to get overturned. I think they're going to wait as long as they can to announce it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think that churches need to be prepared for the aftermath of that. This yeah. isn't going to look like, I don't think it's going to look like the protests during BLM and Antifa. It might have some of that in some bigger cities. I think it's going to look more like um, kind of angry leftist women, you know, showing right. up and throwing paint on themselves or other people or, you know, wearing weird costumes or undressing in the middle of your church service. You know, I think it's <laughs> going to look more like, and we're already yeah. seeing that. Some of that. So yeah. I think that churches need to be really prepared for that. I would highly suggest churches start adding some women to their security team so that if there's some uncomfortable situations like what we saw at, at um, you know, at Lakewood or other, you know, there's a mm -hmm. church there's a big story on where girls are literally undressing in church and protest a Roe v. Wade. Yeah that they can, you know, that they can really, um, you know, in the, in the most, uh, in the safest way possible, you know, um, uh, protect their services. Yeah. The, the, um, so, but I am optimistic. It's going to be, it's going to be a uh, pushback to the States and, and that, you know, Roe will be dismantled from that standpoint. Uh, it doesn't make abortion go away, but it's, right. it's a start. Um, 20 midterms, midterm, major red wave, uh, without a doubt. Um, and if there's not, we absolutely know the entire system is corrupt right. because the whole country is pulling for a red wave right now, with the exception of a few areas, hoping that are, you know, and I, I'm a guy who has seen 2000 mules and seen, followed some of these other things. Um, you know, look, I, I, I've not done the research myself, but I know some of the guys personally who have been involved in that research, um, half the guys in 2000 mules are like on the little panel there with the Salem guys are, our friends or guys that I yeah, know. Sure. Um, and, and I think that it is, 
you know, there, there's, there's something there. This was the most tampered with the election. Uh, I'm not going to go, you know, I mean, you know, would Trump still have won, not won, you know, it doesn't matter. It was a tampered yeah. with election. And so right. we're, well, it's major in the major. And that is we need a free election. Yes. And, and so the results are inconsequential. It, you know, what matters most importantly is that it's free election. So right. I would encourage churches to get involved in becoming poll watchers, helping out with polls, doing everything. Let's make sure there's a lot of accountability across the board and involvement. Um, uh-huh. 2024, man, I don't have a dial in on this on the right. I think the left, and I've said this for, a, I've said this for like a decade, you're going to see Pete Buttigieg most likely on a ticket. I think there's a really high possibility that he is, again, former mayor of South Bend. I know Pete a little bit personally. He would not claim that he knows me, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> but, but um, you know, I've been around him in a few different occasions. Um, and, and I think that he's a really dangerous person on the ticket. He's sharp. He's former military. Um, he is, he speaks multiple languages um and you know obviously and he has an agenda gay. what's that and he has an agenda he has a very strong agenda and that is to transform this country his dad was yeah. a marxist professor at notre dame uh he's the guy who translated the gram chi documents we probably wouldn't have critical race theory at least to the extent that we do today was it not for his family um wow. and so you know this guy's at the center of it he went to school with zuckerberg there's money behind him everything else so he's going to be a major player i don't know if he's going to be on the presidential side or the vice side but he will be a major player in this. Um, and if not 2024, watch out for 2028. But um, DeSantis, Trump, I think in my mind, if Trump runs, the DeSantis will not oppose him. That's what I think. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, now you might still have some other guys throw their names in the hat. I like Pompeo a lot. I, mm-hmm. I think that yeah. it's a better, if I could get the campaigning power of a DeSantis or Trump with a kind of statesmanship of a Pompeo. Yeah. I think that's a great combo. I think that there's less for the left to get mad about with Pompeo, but he's just equally as strong on all those things. Mm-hmm. He just doesn't do it in a flashy way. Right. You know, I he's agree. very chill. I've been very impressed with DeSantis though. Um, you know, of course, Trump is Trump and he's a powerhouse with this. Uh, I think that with, with DeSantis, you get all the Trumpian doctrine with, um, you know, a little bit more youthful vigor but yeah. I've not seen, I mean, I just watched Trump's speech for the faith and freedom event, you know, went on for over an hour. And I mean, it was like, he was at the top of his game. So yeah. I, I think it's, it's a little early to predict, but you know, I, I think it seems to be leaning towards at least Trump flirting with the idea of running. Yeah. Uh, last thing, I promise. Um, January 6th, it- they're trying very hard to hang a felony on him, I believe, to keep yeah. him from running. How do you see that playing out? I don't see it sticking. Good. I just don't think there's the, I don't think there's the support for it. I think they're going to try. And and that's what, I mean, it's important to recognize this January 6th hearing has nothing to do with what happened on January 6th no. in terms of the individual people that they're holding. Um, it has everything to do with trying to make Trump look bad and trying to affect, you know, not only midterms, you know, for this, this red wave that's likely coming, but also to, you know, try to, uh, uh, try to, you know, um, you know, change public opinion about Trump. Trump's, if the last poll I saw, Trump's um, uh, approval rating is higher now than it's ever been. And, and I think that, you know, when people are looking at, I mean, I literally just saw a sign, somebody posted a picture of a 7-Eleven where the gas was $7 and 11 cents. Yeah. They made a joke that the prophecy <laughs> has come true. Right. You know, um, when they're seeing $7 gas, knowing that Trump predicted this would happen under Biden, it's hard for people to not go, you know what, maybe it was a little better back then. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and so, you know, we saw that change real fast Sure, and it just shows you how, and, but again, this is what, what's going on with Biden. I've heard people compare Biden to Jimmy Carter and, you know, I was, I was born in the late seventies. So I, I, you know, this isn't firsthand experience. This is more, you know, historical reading. Carter was just a bad president. Yeah. There was probably some influences on that, but I think in general, he was just a bad president. Biden is doing all the things that he throughout his career has warned people against people doing. I just saw a clip about him talking about how it would take when he was younger, talking about how any attempt to try to get out of Afghanistan in less than a year is ridiculous. Even if you left all the stuff there, he said it would take seven months. This is, I mean, he's literally prophesying this. 
And he goes, and if you left all the stuff, he goes, you're giving guns to all these people that are going to later come back and fight against your own kids. He goes, yeah. that would be that would be stupid. You know, <laughs> Biden's smarter than that. Yeah. He, but what has happened is, and yes, he's old and he's feeble and all these things. That's not my bigger concern. My bigger concern is the people that are around him. This is intentionally being done. They're intentionally yes. trying to devalue the United States and yep. and and de, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of stabilize this nation. Mm -hmm. For the purpose of when the nation is destabilized, that's when socialism can rise up. And yeah. so it's an intentional attack, and, and that's why it's even more dangerous. So, yeah. the, you know, we got to get out of our head that this is just about a good politician versus a, you know, crappy one. This yeah. is about this is about maliciousness to hurt this nation and hurt anybody that stands for freedom. As Trump has said, they're not really after him. They're after us, and they're that's after true. our freedoms. He's just yeah. the guy that happened to be standing in the way. Yeah. I agree. Well, listen, thank you for your time, Lucas. I appreciate it. Hope you'll, hopefully you'll come back again, maybe sometime after the midterms and we can talk about how it all shook out. Hey, I would love it. Hopefully I'll be able to announce my, uh, my new book uh, uh, after that as well. And we'll be into pre, uh, pre-launch and everything for oh, us awesome. so we can talk about it. So it'd be great. All right. Well, Lucas Miles, pastor, uh, best-selling author and uh, social media phenom. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. Thanks, kid. Well, thank you for joining us today for our conversation with Lucas Miles. If you like the content, then please comment in the, in the section below. If you'd like to connect with us on social media, you can find us at YouTube, on Instagram, and TikTok. And if you'd like to connect with Lucas, you can also find Lucas Miles on all social media platforms.